The stage is set for the final day of the Hearthstone Americas Winter Championship. My name is CJ. I'm joined by Ray Nad here at the sidebar, where throughout the day we'll be breaking down some of the matches and setting the tone for the grand finals where we will crown that champion. Ray Nad, how have you been enjoying it so far? Are you looking forward to the final day here? Absolutely. We saw a lot of great games yesterday and a lot of cool decks, and can't wait to see you know how the games play out today. Has there been any surprises so far over the course of the week? And are there any players that are doing better than you expected or maybe performing not as good as you expected? What have you thought so far? Um, I, I've been pretty impressed with Chess Dude's play. It's unfortunate he does have like a one-on-one record so far. Um, I did think Chalky would do a bit better, uh, but it's just uh, some unfortunate matchups. Um, like questionable deck choices kind of, I think kind of kept him from getting those wins that he needed. And we'll talk about the meta a little bit as well. We've seen some players like Amnesiac, who we'll see in the first match, bring some bold lineups with Murloc, Paladin, and Rogue. And uh, we haven't seen nearly as much Freeze Mage as we saw in the winter preliminaries. Uh, so what decks ha have you been surprised by? Have there been any surprise choices or any decks that you thought would be brought more that weren't? Yeah, I didn't really expect to see uh, Murloc Paladin, so that was a surprise, like you mentioned. I expected to see a bit more Zoo, but haven't really seen that either. And then uh, Warrior, great deck, uh, whether it's Patron or Control, but definitely expected to see more Patron. And uh, the players here have kind of brought a lot of Control Warrior, kind of like the newer fatigue style of Gorhal, and it's pretty, it's been working out really well. Good win winning record so far. Yeah, we talked quite a bit about uh, Control Warrior uh, early on before the, the matches started and sort of its evolution. A lot of players that bring Control Warrior, it's on the rise now. Do you think that's uh, one of the decks we'll be seeing moving forward into the other championships as well, or perhaps one of the decks that's in the championship lineup for the Americas? I mean, I, I think it's it's a fantastic deck, and I definitely feel like it'll be good in most metagames, especially a four-deck format where you can have one band. So. Yeah. And uh, so we are going to move into the elimination matches first, where we're going to get into the si deciders and then the semifinals later in the day. Uh, you talked about Chess Dude's play. Uh, do you think it, it's sort of, um, as a con former competitor, do you think it's nerve wracking for players to uh, come into a final day knowing that if they win, they have to play a lot of matches in a single day? Because the deciders, to get to the grand finals, they'd have to play three total matches in a span of just a few hours. Does that weigh into your psyche at all? I mean, it, no matter what your position is in the tournament. You have to just take it one match at a time, and it, it's going to be, you know, a little bit stressful regardless. Um, but, yeah, he seems to be handling it well. In Chess Dude's case, he has, uh, you know, that background with, with chess and playing that competitively. So with already having a tournament background, I think he'll be fine. And uh, you, we talked a little bit over the past couple of days uh, off camera about sort of the, the Chinese scene, and we have two Chinese-American players, uh, one left in the tournament with Sky High. Uh, has Have his decks um, been a, a surprise to you at all uh, with the... You know, the Egg Secret Paladin uh, in Freeze Mage. He's got a different lineup than the other competitors. You're pretty close with the Chinese scene. Uh, Eloise is on Temple Storm, and uh, she was pretty close with the Chinese scene. So uh, ha do those decks from those types of players differ at all from uh, what we see normally in the Americas? Yeah, it's definitely a, a bit wilder of a metagame relative to Europe and North America, which are pretty similar. Um, a lot of, you, you do see kind of standard lists or standard archetypes like Secret Paladin, but they do have these interesting tech inclusions like Nerubian Egg, and mm -hmm. those seem to be working out well for, for Sky High, so. All right, well, let's take a look at what we're going to see today. We're gonna start off with the decider matches. Uh, we'll start with Group A first. It's Amnesiac versus Talion. Of course, the winner moving on to the semifinals. And then for Group B, it's going to be Snail versus Chess Dude. So a lot on the line for those players, and we talked about how they have to play a lot of games if they win there. Then we'll head on to both semifinals and, of course, the grand finals. So there's the bracket for Group A. Nostum coming out in first place. He was sort of an unknown player, uh, made it all the way through. And then, of course, uh, we'll have the second, second semifinals there soon. And of course, Group B, uh, Sky High, we talked about him, one of the Chinese American players here, with sort of a different style than the rest. He made it through in first place, and Snail and Chess Dude will battle it out for that second spot. But once again, thanks, Randad, for the insight. We're going to send it over to Frodan, who's fireside, with some more information about the Hearthstone Championship Tour. Appreciate it, TJ and Rayna. What a great introduction with full analysis over from the sidebar. I'm here in the fireside part of the tavern where the players are going to be engaging for ultimately claiming the championship crown. Today, we have six players remaining in the competition, but only one person will get $25,000 and a chance to call themselves the America's champion for the winter season. Now, I recognize that not everyone's been able to tune in throughout the weekend. We've been revealing cards. We've been seeing lots of games, but some of you guys are curious about how they got here or even 
how can you even qualify for the next season? That's right, you who are watching are also eligible to join the championship tour by qualifying by getting points either through ranked play or becoming a tavern hero. After you qualify for the point threshold, we put you guys in the double elimination bracket, taking the top eight to advance to the regional championships here in Hollywood, California. We'll also be playing best of five conquests with one ban. If you're not familiar, you'll catch up very quickly. Just win once with each of your decks. And before the game starts, you have a blind pick stage. And with that, let us know who you're cheering for as well. We have Amnesiac vs. Talion coming up in just a few minutes. If you're cheering for either of them, hashtag their names and hashtag HCT while you're at it. Tweet at us on Twitter or go to Facebook.com slash Play Hearthstone and really check us out there as well. With that, we're done, so let's go over to the caster desk to begin our first match of day number three. Thank you, Dan. And as he said, that first match of the day is going to be Talion versus Amnesiac. These two players have obviously already met. Amnesiac emerging victorious the first time. Talion really kind of showing a lot of spark as he came in yesterday, took out Chalky, which I'm sure surprised everyone. Uh, were you guys surprised by that result? I was surprised. I'd, I'd have to say Chucky is one of the favorites, or was one of the favorites, at least for this tournament. Um, definitely someone that people pinned a lot of hopes on. He pinned a lot of hopes on himself. So it has to go down as an upset, but we've we've explained to you guys, this is a very good unknown player in Talion that has some excellent stats. Yeah, Talion is great. Against Amnesiac in their first match, he kind of... Um, 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 struggled a little bit there, and uh, Amnesiac got an early lead. Then after that, Amnesiac with his Murloc Paladin dropped two games to Talion, eventually got the win. But here, even though the Murloc Paladin was kind of the, kind of the problem for Amnesiac in their first match, the Paladin is now banned. Right, so we're going to go ahead and introduce our first player, the Canadian card slinger, Talion. Talion came into this as somebody who, you know, wanted to prove that he had that confidence. Right. Still looked a little bit nervous in his first match against Amnesiac, but he's made it this far. He's on the verge of making it to top four. All he has to do is fight his way through Amnesiac, which is no small task, but uh, looking to prove just how good he can be. Uh, for the second player, of course, we are going to have Team Archon's Amnesiac, 15-year-old Hearthstone prodigy who's looking to prove that he is not just one of the best, but in his own words, the best player right now. Uh, doesn't necessarily subscribe to the conventional norms in terms of what decks you have to bring. Believes that if you play them well enough, that you're just going to win anyway. Yeah, a ton of confidence being shown from Amnesiac. Thinks he is one of, if not the best player in the world. Wants to prove it right here. But if you're going to come out with big statements like that, you better be sure that you're able to back it up. Right. Yeah. Amnesiac, one of the fan favorites, I would say, to maybe potentially take, take it all. But he has a long way to go. He needs to win this match and two more after. Right, so uh, very curious to hear your guys' thoughts as we get into this match, but also want to know what you guys at home think. You know, Who are you looking to win this matchup? Tweet with HCT or the hashtag Amnesiac or Talion to let us know who you're going to be rooting for throughout the course of this match. Amnesiac is definitely, as you guys said, the favorite coming into this, but I think Talion has shown there's a case to be made that he could absolutely emerge victorious from this. Oh yeah, he's again expressed a ton of confidence when we've spoken to him, and his, his stats, at least in rank play, back that up. He has some incredibly impressive stats. We highlighted that um, he's actually actually met Amnesiac 15 times before their first encounter and won 11 of them. So that's now 11 out of 16. It's tilting a little bit back towards Amnesiac, but in that sense, he's actually the favorite for the matchup. Yeah, and here we have the classes now. Like I mentioned, uh, Amnesiac will not have his Murloc Paladin available this time. That is something that Talion does not want to fight against, while uh, Amnesiac has banned Talion's Druid. Why is the Druid getting banned? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a powerful deck, but I'm more interested in the, the Paladin ban, really. It's just, it, although it was a deck that Amnesiac actually struggled to win with in the first series, he went out to the 2-0 lead and found it hard to get a win with that Paladin. That really shouldn't have been the case. He had really powerful matchups with it overall, so it makes sense now to see it being banned out. Yeah, we were actually talking a little bit to Amnesiac before the start of today's match, and, you know, he kind of he kind of just grumbled and says, yeah, well, anything works once. It catches him off guard, and uh, he's no longer going to have access. And, you know, when you're bringing your, your tournament composition and you're looking at, at what decks you could possibly be bringing, when your opponent sees Paladin, obviously right now you have to be thinking Mysterious Challenger. On paper, I would say along with Druid, these are two of the most powerful decks. So when you look at that, that's definitely what you're expecting. Why bring anything? I think that, uh, just going back to the bans a little bit, I think that the first match, it would have been also banned if uh, Talion had the information that it was the Murloc Paladin, because he's bringing that Tempo Mage, and when a Doomsayer gets played into a meter entity, bad things happen for the Tempo Mage. Right, just bringing a, an unknown deck like that, it can give you an advantage, and also bringing a polarizing deck like Anything Paladin in a ban format, you can ban out one of the decks that really beats up on it and leave your lineup more open. And then when you get to this stage, there's kind of more of a mind game to the ban phase because 
Do you still think your Anything Paladin is going to be open, in which case you continue to take that strategy of banning out one of the polarizing decks, but you have to consider, OK, my opponent's seen it now. He's seen the Anything Paladin. He knows what's up. Do I expect him to now ban that out? And I go with a more just solid, consistent ban strategy. Right. We can see the poll right there. Italian just a little bit ahead of Amnesiac. Expect that to change over the course of this series. And uh, both these players have a lot of support on social media. Archon, obviously, or uh, Amnesiac, obviously, member of Team Archon, very popular player. But we've actually seen the Canadians are out on force, just like they were <laughs> last year for Hot Form. There's a lot of Canadian Hearthstone pride. Obviously, Toronto's a big Hearthstone city. So glad to see Italian getting that support. And uh, as I've said, Amnesiac, very barely, I would think, just based on reputation, uh, previous results, and everything has to be the favorite. But really looking to see what Italian will do in this one, especially now that he has that deck he wants to ban. He has that any Finn Paladin he no longer has to worry about. Yeah, it's also going to be very interesting to see how these decks line up against each other. For example, Amnesiac does have that rogue, and uh, if it goes up against the Warrior of Talion, he's going to be in big trouble. Yeah, both of these players bringing Control Warrior in their lineup. Control Warrior, just one of the big stories of this tournament, really. I, I expected a lot of Patron coming in, and we've just seen Control Warrior. We do have the potential to see the Control Warrior mirror in this ma in this the series. Old, which, the old tank up pass taken yeah, out. Yeah, which is, let's call it a slow burner. I'm not going to say it's a boring or uninteresting match, but it, it kind of uh, builds to a point and then explodes towards the end. Right, we are going to open up, though, with that uh, Rogue versus Tempo Mage match. And Tempo Mage, one of my favorite decks, has very explosive potential. Uh, Greatly varies from some help on the side of Unstable Portal. So right. it's always one of those matchups where uh, the Rogue, you know, obviously has a very fixed agenda, but the Temple Mage kind of has a little bit more room for iteration. Savits, what do you like in this matchup? Uh, I'm liking the Rogue. This is definitely a good thing for Amnesiac, in my, in my opinion here. Amnesiac is happy to see that Mage up against his, his Rogue, and not the Warrior in particular. The Rogue has a lot of tempo tools to deal with the early minions from the from the mage player, but there are some some difficulties as well. Like for example, mirror entity. How do you deal with it as a rogue? Yeah, it's really difficult. Not too many small minions in the deck. Love Mage Thanos is the one thing, but still that's giving your opponent a card draw death rattle, which is still not ideal. Um, I would agree with Savits here. That um, the, the the tempo mage is is going to struggle in this matchup, but we do see a Ragnaros drawn from Talion. Oh, that can potentially be huge if we get that far in the game. Talion here turned to he has two options. He could either go for Ha! Huh. For a ping. That's very interesting. I would have expected to see the unstable portal over the ping at least. Agreed. Even if you don't play the minion. It's uh, very surprising. That is very strange uh, to see. Sure he has a plan for why he's doing that though. Right. But at the very uh, least I agree. You would think you would just want to use the unstable portal even if you don't necessarily want to sacrifice the sorcerer's apprentice. Yeah, I can totally understand not wanting to develop the, the apprentice onto the board there. Um, just because you expose it to backstab way too early, but he, he seems to plan to save it here and fit it, fit it into his curb with his turn three. Picks up a zero mana three drop, which is the probably the best outcome you can get in that scenario. But honestly, doesn't make a great deal of difference. He had the two spare mana on the previous turn to cast the portal, yeah. so he hasn't really gained anything this turn. Very puzzling. There was also the chance that he would have picked, if he casted the unstable portal on turn two, that he would have picked up a six drop, something right. powerful. Let's say Karen Bloodhoof or, yeah. or anything along those lines. Or and, a four drop that he could play yeah. with the sword. Apprentice, or apprentice, two job. plus one. Yeah. But um, with this line, he, he does get a three drop here, so quite a powerful turn. Amnesiac here has some options. He could get a full clear if he wants to. Uh, You'd have to sacrifice that preparation doing so. Obviously, coin out. Uh, he could do something like coin out piloted Shredder, play that down, preparation the deadly poison, and use the backstab to he could, finish off the Sorcerer's Apprentice. He could also like, double backstab here and just use the weapon as yep. he saved the preparation. But uh, it's possible he will, he will save the backstab too. Okay, he's going for the double backstab, just wants to get that full clear. This is exactly what I was talking about, why I favor the Rogue in this matchup. Those tools, like backstab, are so huge for gaining tempo. Killing two minions, we're basically using zero mana. Yeah, I love it. Uh, this is a huge tactic for Rogue in a lot of matchups. Matchups that are fought on the board is just find that one turn where you swing the board state entirely and you reverse the tempo 100%. It's not as effective against Tempo Mage as it is against something like Druid, because Tempo Mage, tempo mage naturally can play minions and remove minions in the same turn, which Druid struggles to do. But still, it's your target as the Rogue player. Right, so a little bit of insight. This is one of the few decks that I do play a lot of. So get them, Rob. I was going to say, let me get in there and give some high-level analysis. Yep. But see that Flame Waker in hand? You see the two Arcane Blasts. So as a Tempo Mage, you really want that, that Mana Worm at the very beginning, start developing that, getting that board presence. But if you kind of lose out on that stage of the game, your next play is, OK, how do I start using that Flame Waker? How do I start getting that value? And 
I actually think this is a very tricky matchup for the Temple Mage player because you never know, you know, if it's double backstab, if it's something like backstab SI7 agent, the deadly poisons, the blade flurries, things get really out of hand quickly. And speaking of out of hand quickly, Amnesiac is just getting in there. He is using the sharp sword oil and he's going to start putting in that damage now. I love it. This is so aggressive from him. He had the option to prep the sprint and go for right. the guard show, but instead he chooses to take a more aggressive line. And this forces Stallion to, to deal with that Shredder right now instead of developing something like an Azure Drake. Yeah, and I think he looked at his hand and decided I can afford to take this aggressive line because I have my next turn locked up with Sludge Belcher anyway. I'm going to trust my deck to give me one more thing to do on turn six. And then I have the sprint to use after that if I really need to refill and haven't drawn anything else proactive. So this is a fantastic play from Amnesiac just to try oh. and take full initiative and the Flame oh, Waker misses. No. That's a disaster for Talion. He was definitely hoping to, to get rid of that uh, front half of the Shredder oh. with the first blast in order to be able to kill the, kill the pilot with that uh, second one. But <laughs> as it as it is, uh, the pilot, which in this case is the Dark Peddler, will survive. Right. One of the valuable things when you've played your opponent once and, and you've kind of seen some of their other matches is that pretty sure Amnesiac knows Italian is not running any kind of weapon destruction, mm -hmm. so he can safely make that weapon. We saw him not swing with it, and he was just able to deal with anything that uh, Italian was going to drop on that board. Yeah, he actually swung with the one power dagger beforehand and then loaded up the, the big six six power two charge dagger afterwards, so really wanted to ration out that, that dagger to have control of the game in the following turns, and you saw there it wasn't a tool that he was using to go face. It was able to control the board and let him keep developing. Oh, that was another interesting uh, play to me. I would expect to see the scientist over the ping because it's such a great tempo play. Uh, I would have preferred to, to see Italian try to get that secret out from the scientist as fast as possible. It's interesting, now that I think of it, his his secret makeup, I believe, is duplicate and counter spell that we saw in a previous... Was that Italian's secret makeup? I believe there was mirror entity. There was one. a mirror entity? Yeah. Okay. No. I want to say there was. Willing to be wrong on it, but... Amnesiac had the option of a very quiet turn if he just sat on the dagger, but no, he just continues to be very aggressive, and we've seen this all throughout the tournament from Amnesiac. He is a player who, who much like, it kind of runs with Admirable or right. Firebat. They just go in there, they're just like, I'm going to get this damage in now. Mm -hmm. uh, once you're at zero health, you're dead, so I'm not going to sit there and try to pull off anything flashy, and I really like it, and even if Amnesiac is not to advance from this point, he really is making a name for himself in this very, very... Uh, impactful playstyle. Yeah, it's something that a lot of players in Hearthstone <laughs> really do value. Wow. Is the ability to be asking the questions, to be seeking the initiative all the time, making your opponent have it is their philosophy. And if you keep doing that consistently, more often than not, if you play it intelligently, they won't have the answers that they need. Tinker Sharp Sword Oil is drawn, but nothing to combo it right now, which means he is a little bit short. Just going to go ahead and sprint, hope to draw into it. Just one, maybe one more source of damage to be able to finish out this game on the yeah. next turn. Even without oiling this turn, he will still have the, the threat of lethal with his right. next turn. So there's no real reason to, to oil over the sprint in this particular instance. Italian's yeah. Tempo Mage is very unique from kind of what you're seeing on the ladder right now, which is when you... When you build this Tempo Mage, there's generally an understanding that you're you're looking to be the aggressor and you're looking to win probably before before like turn 10, before the game goes for too long and healing starts coming out, Reno Jackson starts getting into the hand. But his is kind of more that mid-range style we saw from Hot Form last time. Like We're seeing the Water Elementals, uh, you know, seeing Ragnaros, which is not a particularly common drop. You usually top out at something like Dr. Boom. Also, Duplicate to help with longevity is just another card draw effect. I don't know if he's he's removed maybe an Arcane Intellect to make room for that, but we see the Drakes are still in, so it seems like he has the extra longevity in his deck here. Yeah, this is uh, this is kind of the price of uh, delaying that Scientist by that one turn. Now he's forced to ping his own Scientist just in hopes to, to survive another turn. But regardless of what secret that is, assuming that it's not Ice Block, we, uh, and uh, it's I don't think he Italian is playing an Ice Block, even if it's a counter spell, even if it's a mirror entry, yeah, yeah, Amnesiac will have the lethal damage here. Right, so I'm pretty confident that's a counter spell which would protect him from the Tinker's Oil yeah. lethal, but he does have the SI agents to do exactly the same job, and Amnesiac, with a very convincing rogue performance, goes out to a 1-0 lead here. Right, I'm actually very much worried. When we saw this the first time, this first matchup, uh, Amnesiac is an extremely confident player, something we've talked about. Saddle, you yourself borders on arrogance. So, right. Uh, Talion seems a little bit more... I don't want to say nervous, but not necessarily as as straightforward in his approach. He's, he's constantly um, playing defensively. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that uh, this was a little bit of nervous uh, performance from Talion here. He has been re playing really solid the past few days, but just the ping on turn two, it's really hard to justify over the unstable portal. 
Yeah, I completely agree. And you know, you say he, he seems a bit nervous, but when we interviewed him, we he had a few choice words. He was bigging himself up just a little bit. And I made the point that if you, you are going to make these bold statements about how you come to intend to win, then you have to be able to back it up with the play. Yeah, I really hope that he's going to slow down a little bit because that hero power in turn two, he didn't just end up hero powering there, but he did it so quickly. He wasted right. almost no time doing so. So going forward from here, I hope he's going to slow down a little bit and maybe get his nerves together if that's why uh, what, what happened here. Right. Well, as you said, Saddle, Talion bills himself as being an extremely confident player, someone who is not necessarily affected by nerves. And we had the chance a couple days ago to talk to him ab about what he feels his strength is as a player. I was playing card games for on and off for 10 years before I ventured into Hearthstone. And since starting Hearthstone, I haven't looked back and have been playing it since. I'm just not very intrigued in um, what school has to offer at the moment. I think of eSports not as a career, but a lifestyle. Being able to travel around, interact with fans, and talk about things that you're truly passionate means a lot to me. So I'd rather be doing something that I really enjoy than to be forced into taking a safe route. My parents aren't, the, uh, aren't super supportive. They're kind of uh, conservative, but I think they just really want what's best for me, and they're not gonna get in my way. If I tell them that I think uh, pursuing career in esports is the best thing for me, I think they will accept that. This tournament is gonna be the most important tournament I've ever played in. It definitely means a lot to me. If I do end up winning this tournament, I do think it's a validation for myself, and I do think I can call myself a professional player at that point. I don't really strive for being the best player in the world. I want to be in the conversation of one of the best players in the world. This tournament is not the end goal. It's just uh, the beginning of the road to the world championship. To me, that's more meaningful than just finishing a good place. So I'm really risking everything and I'm here to win. I'm not here to settle. I'm Talion and I'm gonna prove this weekend that hard work really does pay off and I will win this tournament. Italian looking to win and take this series and go all the way to the grand finals here and secure that spot to the Hearthstone World Championship at BlizzCon later this year, but Amnesiac firmly standing in his way, and I really think this is an example of just the, the dichotomy you can have between players in terms of play styles, as, as I've kind of harped on, amount of confidence and how you approach these things, and uh, Italian already down to Amnesiac in the first time they met, so do you think that plays a factor? Like, is he just even more defensive now in how he plays? Well. It's, I mean, it's definitely one way that fear can take you. The other way is just to play too aggressively. You know, people people right. react to it in different ways. You know, people can just start going all out and start taking too many risks, or they can go back into their shell. It's really going to come down to how Talion reacts to this situation as an individual. Yeah, he seems like such a confident player. So. I don't know, but the stakes have gone up just a tiny bit. This is the final day today. This is a this is a match that if he loses this one, he will be out. So, I don't know. Even if even if he felt confident going in, when the when the situation gets more uh, serious, right. or so to say, it might play a factor. Yeah, it's it's one thing to project confidence in an interview when there's just right. one guy in the camera. When mm -hmm. you come here and you're in this entire environment with the studio, the lights, everyone's watching you, thousands of people at home, suddenly you can start regretting those words just a little bit. Right, you never want to look into the camera and be like, yeah, I'm actually not good enough to do this and I'm 100% <laughs> <Right. 100 laughs> going to lose to anybody I play, but right. uh, I agree. And obviously he understands at this point it is win or go home and desperately wants to win, but let's go back and talk about that ban for a minute. So. When we last saw these players meet up, the Seeker Paladin, or sorry, the Eddie Finn Paladin did struggle, Savitz, as you pointed out earlier. It went 0-2 before finally getting that win. And, you know, you can chalk up one of those matches. We did see just incredibly poor draw from yeah. a deck that is so good at cycling. But uh, do you think really that changes the outcome of this matchup, possibly? I do think that the ban from Dalian was right. It was correct to still ban that, that Murloc Paladin, even though Amnesiac struggled with it. Because... Uh, the draws that Amnesiac had in those games that he lost with it were just extremely poor. I can, I can remember the games very clearly. In the first one, Amnesiac just never got any card draw that he needed so desperately. And the second one, he just never had the time. He got all the card draw, but just not enough time to play all those expensive cards. Yeah, I think the second game, he, he got all the card draw, drew everything he needed except an equality. Like except one equality yes. would have just won the game. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. 
But right, so. Second game is ready now. Looks like we're going to have Control Warrior, that slower removal based Control Warrior that's been extremely popular in this tournament with a Gore Howl from Amnesiac as well, I believe, in his deck. Right, now, was this the deck that was banned the first time they met? I actually did not cast that series, so I'm not sure, but I, I don't feel like we saw the matchup of Control Warrior. No, we actually did see this. It was Control Warrior versus ha Demon Handlock, and Amnesiac right. did win that match. So yep. we've already seen him do this once, and Gore Howl was a big part of it. That Tecton Gore Howl that we don't see too much of on the ladder these days. And uh, Talion should have the edge in this matchup. Hopefully he watched that first matchup and kind of understands where he navigate, needs to navigate better. Yeah, and this is a great opening interaction for him here. Zombie Chow comes down, immediately cleared up with the Fiery War Axe. Fiery War Axe is a card that can lose a lot of value very quickly as it goes into the later turns in this matchup, so nice to get some use out of it early, Savit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Talion here, going for the life, but with a Dark Peddler on turn two. I think he's, he might be planning to coin out the Void Caller on turn three to try to get that Mulliganis on the board as fast as possible. I was going to say, you could have possibly played Dark Peddler on turn two. Is there any hesitation towards tapping since you already have Void Caller Mulliganis that maybe you're afraid if you draw more cards, you get something like Jaraxxus, you get a no. demon you don't want to initially bring out from Void Caller. Is there any reason to possibly just play that Dark Peddler on two, Sotl? Sure, there is actually a big decision about whether you play Peddler on two in this deck, and it relies on what you expect your four drop to be a lot of the time, because sure, Peddler places itself in your hand, but you're skipping a life tap to play it, so you end up one card down. So your Twilight Drakes will be smaller, maybe a Mountain Giant isn't playable on the same turn. But as you said, with Void Call and Malganis in the hand right now, taps just seem to be potentially detrimental to pulling it out a different demon as opposed to the hugely powerful Malganis. Yeah, it looks like he wants to try to draw as much as possible, probably partly because of the, the Molten Giants as well, because Molten Giants are hard to play against this type of warrior that is not really even trying to kill you or, That's a really or good go point. for the face that much. So you have to deal the damage to yourself instead of the, the warrior. Yeah, that's a really good point, Savits. I like that. Just get the life tap down so you're able to activate your threats. Because you can find situations in this matchup where you've played your first few threats, your Twilight Drake, maybe dropped a Lotheb on the board, and then the only remaining threats in your hand are those Molten Giants, and you're just unable to activate them. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. Right, we did see that Void Color come down as opposed to the Twilight Drake, which came right off the top of the deck, seemingly on time. And wow, there's going to be a perfect clear on Malganis. <laughs> he's actually not eternal. He's, he's about four <laughs> seconds of Malganis just, just before. Still echoing the, the roar of being eternal his, when, it, when it his down. Death now went longer than his actual in play time. So uh, <laughs> that was really convenient clear for Amnesiac on that Malganis, which is a card which, you know, can give Warrior a little bit of trouble if they don't have the quick removal for it. Curious to see if he looks at this Twilight Drake again. Yeah, now's the time to get that value on it. And 4-9 is another stat line that's really difficult to deal with for the Warrior. Yeah, and having seen one hard removal come down, it's going to be tricky to, to act to, to remove. Even if there's an Execute in hand from Amnesiac, he'll still need an Activator to go with it. So um, as you said, Malgan is taken down very efficiently, but still a decent amount of gas in hand here for Talion to keep developing. Silvana's Windrunner. No Seems like a good spot for it when the Twilight Drake is still at full health. Unless Talion has an Owl, the Sylvanas is pretty much guaranteed to steal something. Yeah, this uh, this could go downhill very quickly here for Talion, because I think one of the plays you definitely consider making here is a defensive play where you taunt up small minions with the Sun Fury Protector, and just consider ignoring the Sylvanas, but we do see the Brawl in hand from Amnesiac that would punish that very hard. Now, I would really love him to see Talion first play that, at least a Young Priestess, and then potentially swing at the Sylvanas, go for the Coil to finish right. it off, Hope that your opponent does not steal the Drake. Oh, he's even playing the Sun Fury. But like, I'm almost certain he's gonna gonna deal with the Sylvanas here. But let's see if he if he does, or if I he's mean, just gonna risk the brawl. Yeah, it's a really huge decision. He does choose to deal with it. There, there yeah. probably was a temptation for him there to ignore it. But he's gonna he's gonna try and deal with the situation here. He has the Dark Bomb in hand here that can clean up if he needs to, and that's perfect. Yeah, so that's just go ahead and mortal, mortal coil, coil that again. That. Yeah. Uh, Amnesia can't be happy with that result. When you play down the Sylvanas, especially as a control warrior in that spot, you're really looking to get more value because you're just inherently going to get outvalued by the Warlock, so you need to right. pick something big up. And Twilight Drake would have been perfect, but uh, he gets that Young Priestess and it's already dead. Yeah, very well done by Talion there, dealing with that Sylvanas. It can be extremely tricky at times. Mountain Giant just comes into hand for Talion on that turn, and this is a, a very greedy build of the, the Demon Handlock. We see Twilight Drakes, Void Callers, and the Mountain Giant in the deck. Normally, Void Callers and Mountain Giants kind of interchangeable. You play one or the other, depending on whether you're playing the Demon Package or not. But he's really piling up on threats, which is going to be a pretty big deal in a matchup like this. Yeah, for a 
for a control matchup, it's uh, the greedier, the better. Yes. Against an aggressive uh, deck, like let's say a face shaman, like a aggressive shaman, all those mountain giants, twilight drakes, you might not have the time to get them played. But the warrior is not really putting any pressure, so. So even if, it, like, no matter how stacked it is, it's still hoping that it would be even more so. Right, and you gotta think the more threats you have, you guys said it, in this control mirror, uh, having more threats is just simply better. And at that point for Talion, it's just kind of managing how many things you're putting on the board at once, how much you play into brawls, and uh, from there, though, again, Mountain Giants, Twilight Drakes, Malganus, Demons everywhere. You really should just have the gas to go the distance in this matchup. Yeah, extra Mountain Giant is committed to the board here. I was just going to say, I wonder if this is going to be enough to provoke the Brawl from Amnesiac. Uh, Talion had the option of developing there with Lotheb to try and consolidate that board for a bit longer, but he decided to take the risk, push in early before it's too likely that the opponent has drawn the Brawl. And if, the, if it, that board had stuck, he would have been in a devastatingly strong position, but the Brawl does come out. I was going to say, he has enough mana to play that Doomsayer. I kind of like it here, just bringing it out now. Possibly blocking a play from Talion on this turn, because Talion still has a lot of cards in hand. Yeah, this is actually a really important turn to block here, because one of the best ways you can beat this incredibly kind of slow build of Warrior with this deck is to develop Jaraxxus. And the key to developing Jaraxxus on turn 9 is getting yourself very far ahead on turn 8, so that you can do that with security. So by blocking development this turn, he's holding that back, and he's saying, okay, I get first play on the board next turn, which means I'm, I can attempt to be ahead and try and scare you from playing that turn 9 Jaraxxus. Yeah. Pretty good play for Amnesia here, dropping that Doom Sir, but Talion doesn't have much issues with just Hero Power passing. Right. Yeah, I agree. Um, draws the Emperor. This is uh, something that we've seen already yesterday, is just dropping the Emperor into play. Uh, into the Doomsayer just to get the discount, but Talion values having the 5 5 body as a threat in this matchup here, I think. Emperor Thor is an absolutely a huge draw for, for Talion. Having it, uh, having it, uh, <coughs> being able to play it while you already have Lord Charaxus in your hand is, is really awesome because being able to play the Lord Charaxus eventually for 8 mana allows you to, to use the Infernal or spawn the Infernal on the same turn. Right, and we do see Talion's got a full hand of cards here. Would not be surprised to see that Emperor, as you guys have been talking about, get that discount on Jaraxxus, get the discount on the pair of Dark Bombs. That could be a really, really impactful turn once it all pieces itself together. I mentioned Jaraxxus. Do you want to bring up Harrison Jones, the natural enemy of Jaraxxus, <laughs> and something that could bring the Warrior right back into it, as the Warrior tends to generally have less cards than the Warlock, and can bring him right back into having a lot of cards. It's definitely something to be mindful of, and Italian does know that uh, Amnesiac is running the Harrison Jones, so so because of that, it's possible that Talion will only keep the Lord Charx as kind of a, like a last resort if, if he uh, runs out of other things to do. Right, I think if you if you can play it early in this matchup still, when your opponent at least has a few cards in their hand, so the Harrison isn't a complete blowout, you know, going from like one card back up to nine or something, still the advantage of a 6-6 six, six every turn for essentially free is just such a huge advantage building up over the course of the matchup. It really is. Sometimes with the Charaxxus, you can also stop tapping at some point and, uh, and play it, not attack with the weapon, and make the warrior fatigue right. if they want to play the Harrison. Right, this is one of my favorite things about getting the opportunity to see these two players meet up again, is this time they have so much more information on each other, it kind of comes down to who really did their homework, who understands the lineups, and again, Talion does know that Harrison Jones is there, as you said, so uh, Harrison Jones basically blocks that Jaraxxus into a last-ditch effort where you're mostly looking to heal, or the Warrior is already in fatigue, so playing Harrison just suddenly becomes such a bad idea. Yeah. Right now, everything seems to be going Talion's way. He still has more threats to play. He has an amazing board that Amnesiac is going to struggle to deal with. I believe Amnesiac does have the tools to get a full clear, but he has to use multiple cards in order to do so. Yeah, he could put some stuff together here, but as you said, it would be pretty much the end of all of his resources here. Um, but this board does demand a reaction. No second Brawl in hand, which would be the dream here for Amnesiac. So he's going to have to do his best just to take this, uh, this board apart one by one. <laughs> Let's see if he shields some. I, I think he's going to save the shield some for later on because like, <laughs> three cards and the dead spite, that's a little bit too much. Yep. Right, and that's, that's the pinnacle of restraint because I know if I'm playing that match on ladder, I'm like, I can do four damage. It has four health. <laughs> Why wouldn't I do it? Right, uh, the key is, is that you have that second swing death spite up, yep. so you know you want to target on the board for that next turn. There's no point wasting a key removal when you already have this weapon developed. You already have Justicar in play, so, so this Lothar hitting you in the face is actually only doing one damage compared to what your hero power piles up. So no great reason to overreact to it just now. 
Yeah, here we see that the early life, early aggressive life taps from Talion really paying off. Being able to play that molten giant, even though it's eight mana, that's that's still pretty good against in a situation like this against the warrior. Right, you start to get to a point in this matchup where you basically just whittle the warrior down to one to two cards, mm -hmm. and you can start feeling safe about overextending a little bit and starting to press your own advantage because again, you just have a handful of threats. We we see so many good cards in Kazan Mystic in Talion's <laughs> hand. Kazan Mystic, uh, <laughs> the underperforming card of this tournament. Everyone was really expecting Freeze Mage. Didn't really want to waste so, yeah. a ban on it, but uh, I think Kazan Mystic has iced out one game, and uh, so because we yeah. were talking about it, didn't even really need it to do so. Yeah, the Kazan Mystic has seen to be a little bit of as a meta call for this tournament. We have seen a lot of it, but this, like, like you said, one game where it has been played successfully against the Freeze Mage, but even in that one, there was still a, a lot of good plays and the game was already going uh, going the Warlock's way, so it was kind of like, okay, well, it was already a win. I've seen it quite commonly in a, a bunch of online tournaments that I've been casting recently where Freeze, uh, Freeze Mage has been common, people have brought Kazan Mystic and it's been extremely successful, so there might be an argument to say that some people have um, just stayed a little bit behind the meta here and reacted to, to what's happened in the past as to what's happening right now. Wow. Gromash being played out as a form of removal here from Amnesia. What an aggressive play. Yeah, Amnesia, that, Amnesiac just going for the Grom. He is really low on cards, so he wants to save the bash and the shield slam for later on. Doesn't want to use them here. Talion with a big game hunter is in his hand. I would expect that to come out because Grom, I believe, is the only thing to big game hunt in this particular warrior list. Right, and you know, Grom can be used a couple of different ways in these matchups, and sure, you're gonna get the two for one, you do force the big game hunter out, but at the same time, it limits the warrior's reach by so much, and the warlock with the ability to, to manipulate health so readily, it's just one of those things where you really needed to close out the game, and I remember Kit Kat saying way back in the day that when you're playing against a handlock, you know, if you're not actually using the Grom to close out the game, like, you're kind of throwing the game away. Right, and there's another aspect to that as well. We talked about the fear of uh, Harrison Jones when you play Jaraxxus. The other fear of playing Jaraxxus in this matchup is that you're so close to just that natural range of Death Spite and Gromash, just with your maximum health being 15. So with Grom gone, Jaraxxus is now a lot more secure, but big game hunter off the top from Agnesiak. Not a terrible draw right now. <laughs> no, not at all. That's excellent. He got used to it a tiny bit earlier, but it's still great, and uh, I think he's gonna use it here. It's possible he wants to save it for later on, for the second Molten Giant, perhaps, but I, I think we're gonna see it here, because he can, he can he will still have that one Shield Slam if he needs to deal with another big threat. And right. see Amnesiac acting just a little bit hastily there. He actually picked up the big game Hunter and was about to commit it to the board, and now he's considering whether he wants to Shield Slam it instead. Oh and um, one of the I things you really need to focus on in this situation is making sure you uh, map out your full play in your head before you start aiming cards anywhere because of the right. information it reveals to your opponent. And that is one possible weakness of Amnesiac's very aggressive style as we see him take these fast turns. And as you said, it's one of those things where he takes like half the turn. It's like, oh yeah, I could have actually shield slam. So uh, not to say that always being super aggressive and being super confident in your plays is without fault as a play style. So back to Talion here, and the resource advantage is just mounting up here on the side of the Warlock. And as we mentioned, with the Gromash gone, that's one of the great equalizers, where it, it doesn't matter how many resources you have in your hand if you're dead. So with Gromash being able to burst down here, that was one of Amnesiac's main outs. And with that removed, he's going to have to find some way of just dragging this game out and putting himself back into it. Yeah, we can see that the, the Lord Charaxxus would, would work out so well for Talion right here if he chose to just play it. But it has to be in the back of his mind that one of Amnesiac's two cards could be that Harrison Jones that has been mentioned you know a couple what? of times. Dr. Boom's a pretty good play, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, at this point, for Talion, it's just, as you guys have kind of been hinting at, it's it's what makes him lose as opposed to what helps him win. Because in the long game, he pretty much knows he has this now. And Death Lord, a very ineffective draw, will provide him a little bit of effective extra health. Uh, obviously, if it is not silenced or, or dealt with via spells, but it really needs uh, something like that Elise Star Seeker to start generating those legendary cards to possibly have to pull himself back in. Absolutely. Yeah, I think even Elise is just going to be too much of a slow burn at this point. It's not going to have too great an impact on the board. It's going to be dealt with pretty efficiently, and at the, the average time it takes to draw all the way through to get to the actual Golden Monkey, it's probably going to be too far. So not exactly sure what Amnesiac is looking for here to try and drag himself back in. I was thinking that there might have been an option to, to keep that Death Lord in the hand to try to maybe like uh, 
bluff the Harrison Jones in case, the, case Talion did yeah. have the Lord Jaraxxus. Yeah. But he will play it here. And now this is going to be interesting to see if Talion wants to pull the trigger on the Jaraxxus or not. Yeah, and you can tell from Amnijak's body language, he's just not having a good time this game. He understands he's just living off the top of his deck and uh, might be factoring in a little bit because Amnijak is usually the sort of player who, as you said, Tavis, would, would kind of see that line and kind of keep Jaraxxus at bay single-handedly through something like that. And with that Molten Giant down, and you know he's just basically every card he draws is the only card he's going to have. Uh, it might feel good to play Jaraxxus soon. That Brawl is about as good as it gets. I don't think it's going to be enough in the long term to pull Amnesiac back in, but Savits, would you even consider sacrificing your Death Lord first here before Brawling? I think I would actually wait another turn okay. here and just uh, just save the Brawl. But, uh, but if you're going for the Brawl, definitely uh, sacrifice the Death Lord first. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's just going to play it here. Let's All see right. what wins. If the Giant wins, that's a huge problem for Amnesiac. The Death Spite will, wouldn't be enough to clear it. All right. Hillbot is fine. Four damage to face from the Boombot. Not a big deal. This isn't going to be a, a matchup that's dealt with in life too soon. It's just going to come down to whether uh, Talion has the remaining threats to push through. I was going to say, it might just be Jirax's time. Yeah. Uh, we've reached the point in proceedings where he's going to need those 6-6s six every turn here because, we, as we saw, he is nearly out of cards, one card remaining in the deck, so he needs to make sure he's able to build up that board presence quickly before his fatigue starts to become an issue. That's right, and unless Amnesia gets the Harrison Jones very quickly, I, I don't think he can stop the Taraxxus. No, he's going to draw that Ooh. second copy of Revenge. And Talion was pretty much thinking, you can draw any card here except Harrison Jones. <laughs> yeah, don't yeah. draw Harrison Jones. Exactly. Having nightmares about it, but... And Revenge uh, will get rid of the antique heal bot and will allow him to swing with the second charge of the death bite, clear that Dread Infernal, but again, unless he draws that Harrison Jones, as you said to me, he's just kind of delaying the inevitable. And there's also quite a bit of damage in Talion's hand mm. right now. There's actually there's 11 direct damage. Ooh, Void Caller. That's pretty good, because that will allow him to get the Doom card on the board without discarding any cards. Well, that's assuming... I mean, Amnesia can even clear it at this point. <laughs> yeah, Might right. just uh, stay on the board and, and pretty much end the game. And with both brawls gone, he can really afford to just make the heaviest play possible here. He doesn't really have to consider over committing here. He just needs to make sure he loads up on power as much as he possibly can so that he can beat the clock that Fatigue has on him right now. Right, and Mijak might be thumbing towards that. Yep, there's the concede, and Talion's gonna go ahead and tie up the series, learns from the first time this matchup happened, and manages to right the ship and kind of win that favorable matchup. Yeah, that warrior deck is mainly geared to beat aggro, and uh, Talion was playing such a, such an, uh, um, a late game heavy or a threat heavy deck that uh, Amnesiac really struggled to turn it around. Right, that's an extremely greedy handlock deck, very much uh, focused on having all those demons and all those threats, and Kind of an interesting meta call when you think about it, because Demon Handlock really hasn't been a factor in a ranked play in tournament for, uh, has to have been at least six or seven months. Yeah, that deck potentially has the strongest proactive plays out of all the decks, because you can fit in so many big minions, Twilight Drakes, often on four nines, four tens, all those giants. It's uh, quite powerful. Also, it's a build that I, I'm quite a big fan of, because it doesn't even suffer that much against aggro. We saw that he has the, the zombie chow in there, and also Void Caller gives you this extra thing that you can do on turn four, after you've reacted to your opponent's board state for a couple of turns. You know, you've you've coiled a Lepinome, you've Dark Bombed something, you still have a strong four drop that you're able to play that isn't reliant on hand size. Right, so as we see here on the social media poll we have running right now, Talion and Amnesiac really neck and neck as is befitting wow. a 1-1 one, one series. So yep. again, go out there, tweet with hashtag HCT, use the hashtag Amnesiac, hashtag Talion, vote for your favorite, vote who you think is going to win, and just get out there and discuss what's going on. This is a very important series for both of these players, possibly career making, if they can make it to that round of four and then eventually to the world championship. But let's take a little bit of a closer look at Amnijak if you haven't seen too much of him over the course of the weekend. 15 years old, pro team, youngest player we have on a pro team. So uh, for Amnijak, he's up there with the, the ranks of Brian Kibler, Reyna, these players who have these pedigrees of starting out really young and making a name for themselves. Yeah, and the impressive thing for me about Amnesiac is that I looked at his stats and he has a ton of games, a ton of wins, an incredibly impressive win rate, but he does that not as a full-time Hearthstone player. He actually balances it with school and other commitments and does a great job of you know, being successful and really rationing his priorities. Yeah, we saw for, you know, players like Jockey who, who've made this a full-time career, like, as you said, that's kind of it. That's what they're doing. They're yeah. pursuing this. And Mijak's like, ah, I'm going to go to school, play some soccer afterwards, and I guess I'll just qualify for the America's Winter Championship. So, <laughs> No uh, big deal. Very impressive. So uh, we are going to go really quickly to Froden, who is standing by uh, someone who is... Uh, actually, never mind. We're not going to be doing that. So 
Uh, looks like we're actually going to get Aww. a into game three. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was me. He was just going to interview me and how much I like MJ. Oh, fair enough. So, okay. Um, it just missed being with Frodan on the desk. But, yeah, we're going to get ready for that game three. And both players have two decks left, uh, mm -hmm. and they're going to be looking to get those wins with. So don't necessarily want to fall into the trap of what deck in Conquest do you think they'll be playing? But Ace of Eats, <laughs> what decks do you think they'll be playing? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe Warrior. Go I'm kind of getting hyped for the I was going to say, get some but... dice out of the back here. You just... <laughs> Start yeah. going for it. I mean, I think that uh, there's no real like uh, advantage to trying to plan it out here. Which deck do you go with? If one of the players is just randomizing it, then it's all out the window. There's no mind games. But right. if you can successfully predict what your opponent is going to pick in the next game, yeah, use it to your advantage. Pick the one that you think is better against that particular deck. And yeah, we are seeing, of course, Talion has that Warrior and Tempo Mage left. And Nijak has Druid and the Control Warrior. So uh, we may, of course, end up in the control warrior mirror. But there's at least Starseeker, I believe, at least in one of the decks. So if, if the game goes long, we might have an exciting ending. I can't quite remember seeing a golden monkey action in a competitive game before. Just yeah. in, in, in terms of the lineups as well and the, the deck choices, it's, it's common for people, especially newer, less experienced tournament players, to stick with the same deck after they've lost with it in, an, in Conquest. Um, so it's a potential read that you can get, and it's something that I've heard people talk about as a read that they do have if they're playing an inexperienced player, is there's that element of stubbornness that comes in. But also, it's kind of strategically solid to stick with the same deck a lot of the time anyway, because when you made the decision the first time, mm -hmm. you said, this is the right deck against their lineup. So what's changed in the meantime? It still seems like the second the, that deck that you went with will be the right choice. So that is a potential read you can get. You expect your opponent to stick with the same choice. Yeah, we have seen, though, when Talion was playing Chalky, Talion was willing to just be to the deck he felt had the best matchup right. against the aggro shaman whereas a lot of players would just be like i have to win with the deck that has the hardest time anyway and i'll just save some time you know go out and get some lunch after sure. so italian has shown a willingness to kind of get that confidence win which so important when you are coming in as one of these players who uh you're maybe not necessarily as confident as your opponents that you're going to win so uh don't want to dwell too much on it but psychology is always an important aspect in tournaments yeah, it is. The mental side is a huge preparation. So much of success in tournaments comes down to stuff that's outside playing the games itself. It's it's your mental focus, it's your preparation, it's your deck building. All this stuff probably adds up to being honestly more than 50% of your, your total chance of winning a tournament. Absolutely. This player still thinking about what to go with. Might have it locked in, ready to go into game three. Honestly, looking at the, the stances there, Amnesiac looking the more confident player, Talion a little bit hunched over, clenched fists, looking a, a little more tense about things. Amnesiac very laid back in his player cam of the... <laughs> he's, uh, he's been complaining all weekend that he doesn't have a bouncing ball to sit right. on, so uh, that might be a little bit why he, he looks kind of dejected, mm -hmm. having to sit in an actual chair that does not bounce up and down. Yeah, all we... right, Rob, we have <laughs> dodged the control warrior mirror that you were much maligning. <laughs> I'm not sure which I enjoy less between the freeze mage mirror and the control warrior. I think it's actually the control warrior mirror. They're both wonderful, special no, flowers subtle. of matchups, no, Rob. Yes. They're not. Okay. There's also no hunters in this deck, <laughs> which is the worst thing. Yeah. Uh, we are going to see, as you said, we, we've dodged the control warrior mirror, and we are going to get into control warrior versus tempo mage. And uh, traditionally speaking, prior to this build of Control Warrior that uses almost exclusively removal, none of those uh, clunky legendaries at the end of the game to kind of close it out, I would say this was actually favored to the Tempo Mage, especially if you're running stuff like Water Elemental, which can give the Warrior problems. With Savits, what do you think? Yeah, I completely agree with that, but with the type of deck that the, the, the version that the Amnesiac is running, there's much more early game tools, like the Death Lord that we see in his hand, oh, and also a lot of the late game legendaries, such as Yushera, Alex Raza, that usually have been uh, completely useless because you simply don't have the time to play those. Those cards are not in the deck, so there's much, much less dead cards in, uh, so to say, in uh, Amnesiac's deck. Yeah, I will say in Talion's favor, though, he has a pretty good build of Tempo Mage put together to fight this matchup. He has the Water Elementals, which are huge, but he also has those duplicates that he can use to um, gain additional gas, because honestly, one of the ways Tempo Mage tends to lose this kind of matchup against the super removal heavy warrior is they just run out of stuff to do. Right, as you guys said, this, uh, this sort of Tempo Mage much more uh, tooled for dealing with control as you have the the card generation you have a lot of card draw and ragnaros at the end is a, is a very big threat so you're not necessarily just topping off at dr boom and kind of hoping for the best this actually should be a really exciting matchup but we do see amnesiac opens up with the fiery war axe which is a great answer for the mad scientist plays the death lord which is going to be a little bit difficult for talion to chew through yep no uh no mirror entity so the secret is going to be either a, either a uh, counter spell or a duplicate 
And if it's a duplicate, how good is the Sorcerer's Apprentice here? Yeah, it doesn't feel too good. I think you want to duplicate something of higher value. Water Elemental, uh, Azure Drake, for example, would be great. If you don't, you know, you don't have to get super greedy and try and duplicate your Doctor Boom or your Ragnaros, but something with some mid game power, something that's effective in the matchup. So, um, interesting to see he is going there with, with the Sorcerer's Apprentice here. That suggests to me that there wow. is a, um, that this is a uh, counter spell that we have in play and not a duplicate. Wow, three cards on the Death Lord. That is. Okay, it gets a low pep, so that's pretty good. Okay, that's not bad at all. I mean, the battle cry does kind of get wasted, but but still getting a 5-5 five, five instead of something like Mana Worm is really huge. Right, we're going to see that duplicate on the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and uh, uh, not super impactful. I would agree, you definitely want that on something okay. more like a Water Elemental. Uh, even on the low that would have been really, really good, but... Ah, so, since we have all these Sorcerer's Apprentices now, uh, what do we make of where we're standing in the game? He did have a possible turn this turn of uh, Apprentice, Apprentice, Arcane Intellect, so it would have been five mana, but the Doomsayer kind of shuts that idea down, so he's going to have to decide whether he values this 5-5, five five, um, whether he wants to remove it with the... The only method he has, really, of doing that, though, is with the Fireball that's horribly inefficient yeah. at this point. Looks like he's just going to go for Arcane Intellect, maybe hoping to pick up something like a Frostbolt. If he doesn't, maybe Unstable Portal or, yeah, portal or just isn't play bad. the Scientist into, to, to get that secret. Go ahead and portal here. Cold Light Ooh. Oracle. Interesting. Now let's discuss how that could be used in this matchup, because he's got a lot of cards already. Yeah. He's not hurting for card draw. Do you possibly force the warrior to mill cards if you get him to around 10? It's this build of warrior doesn't tend to have a huge hand a lot of the time because they're going one for one spot removal with all right. your cards. It's not like the old school Control Warrior deck that's cycling their acolytes and just armoring up and waiting. You know, they really are going one for one with your cards. So the mill seems a little bit unlikely. Yeah, the mill seems very unlikely to me as well. I think that the way that the gold light is going to get played is is by either if he has no other options, looks like things are going wrong. So kind of like a, a desperation move. Or if he's very close to killing Amnesia, can uh, hoping to get an extra file fireball or so to finish it off. Yeah, that's a really good point. Zero mana card draw as well. The way it's come out. So if he needs to fish for lethal, he can dig through his deck for two additional cards without any restrictions on his mana. So that might come into the game in the the closing stages. But Drake is a nice pickup here, just to keep cycling through, give him something to do. Not great to play out into a pre-equipped death spite, but does get to play the mana worm alongside it to at least try and hold onto some sort of board presence. Right, obviously hoping that Axe Bite go, or Death Bite goes right into the Azure Drake, and somehow against a deck that's literally a million percent removal, <laughs> that 1 3 Mana Worm just makes it out unscathed. And uh, we know that's probably not going to happen unless he decides to just go for that Justicar True Heart. I mean, the other thing with this kind of removal warrior deck is that you, you really have to evaluate the threats that are put in front of you. You have to look at every card your opponent plays and say, does this deserve a bash? Does this deserve a shield slam? You know, this this pitiful 1-3, one, 1-mana one card. Hey. Oh, sorry, am I not allowed to talk smack about Mana Worm, Rob? He's going to get there, okay? He's okay. going to go to school, <laughs> hit the gym. He's going he's gonna to get up to like two or three attack and just be a really strong guy. But yeah, just to finish the thought, <laughs> um, I'm not at all surprised to see Amnesiac just dropping the Justicar here. No need to react too heavily to this Mana Worm. He, he is getting kind of dangerously low, but it would be a pretty spectacular sequence of cards to punish him too hard from here. Second fireball gets drawn from the top, so Talion has quite a bit of reach here, but no lethal just yet. Only has the mana to cast one of those, and even if he could cast both, it would still be a, just a tiny bit off. Doctor Boom looks like the obvious turn seven, but with the Justicar on the board, Amnesiac would have the option to attack with the Justicar into the Doctor, and then use the weapon on the mana worm to get a full clear easily. Yeah. yeah, Justicar in combination with that Whirlwind is going to make a mess of this Dr. Boom, but he goes ahead and plays it anyway. I guess just valuing the potential of those Boombots hitting face. Yeah, the Boombot damage alongside those two Fireballs could be enough to to finish the job. Savic doing a beautiful job up here illustrating uh, on the monitor what it would look like if those <laughs> Boombots hit face. Yeah, four. Uh, 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 okay, uh, so those sure. are pretty good. Uh, sure. Average, average result. That's Some, what you get from sometimes, uh, yeah. sometimes fortunate. Sometimes fortunate. And yet, coins out the tank up. This is this is control warrior life right here. Is I'm going to spend this coin just to get four extra armor right now, and uh, I believe it's Ragnaros time. Yeah, I think so too. He thinks that he probably wants to hit face, but uh, if he, if that five five leaves, I don't, I don't know. It's it's an interesting situation. 
Yeah, I think I'm okay with it hitting face though, right? You just yeah. you gotta keep peeling back but, the armor. But it's not as good as you would imagine because of uh, because oh, of the extra shield block, because of the shield made and all that stuff. It's just uh, now the five five is going to start chipping in. Right, I think as Tally in there, it's hard to know what you want because removing the five five sort of takes bash out of the equation. Bash five five plus bash to remove the rag. Hitting face takes shield slam out of the equation because you remove all the armor. BGH works either way. So I think Talion was just like, oh, we'll play rag. Either outcome is going to do something. I'm gonna, right. So yeah. like, this is fine. That's one of the one of the strong uh, things about Ragnaros. Like even if it goes for face, it doesn't mm. kill the target or, or the big minion that you might be sometimes hoping for it to hit. You still get that eight damage for eight mana. Not too bad. Right. Right. And we do see Italian now no longer has that Doctor Boom. No longer has that Ragnaros. So. Uh, do not know if we saw Archmage Antonidas in this deck. Would be pretty surprised if it wasn't in there. That is a staple of Tempo Mage. Yeah, and I was just about to make the point that with three Sorcerer's Apprentice in hand, he, <laughs> he could have some Archmage Antonidas fun if it is in the deck. But he's going to play them out here, needs, decides he needs to react to the board. I think he's completely correct in taking this line. Just needs a little bit of luck on the big I'm game, Hunter. Doesn't uh, get it. Those Flame Wakers have been very inconsistent for Talion, as is <laughs> unfortunately their nature as a card. I'm a little bit surprised by that, because he, he only one out of four times he gets the both of the missiles on that on that big game hunter. So he did have the option to kind of play it a little bit safer, not play the apprentices and save that extra two mana for the ping right. in case he hits the BGH Would only once. Know? Yeah, makes a lot of sense to me. He'd still hold back some, some minions in his hand, but these Sorcerer's Apprentice, as we drag towards the late game, unless it's going to create some nonsense with an Archmage Antonidas, they are quickly losing their value. So I can also understand the mentality of getting them on the board. I like how you call that nonsense when we've seen so many videos and YouTube clips of the fun happening yeah. uh, with Sorcerer's Apprentice, you know, having four of them and just infinite fireballs. It's not nonsense, Saddle. It's fun. Just let the fun in. Are those two words not synonyms? Sorry, that's how I'm, I was using I'm actually, them. in America, it's fun. Ah, uh, okay. This is an America's Championship song. Right. You'll, you'll have to come over to Britain and explain the concept of fun <laughs> to us as, as a nation, just make it all clear. Sure, and we are yeah. going to see that Oracle come down as unfortunately Italian is starting to get low on resources. Really needs a big result from this unstable portal. Yeah, he didn't find the time that he, that he, <laughs> he would have considered good for the Mad Scientist earlier on, and now he drew his counter spell. So I'm not even sure if there's more secrets left in Talion's deck anymore. Rob, you said he needed a big result from Unstable Portal. How would you assess the size of this result that we see? Uh, I mean, you have a butler now. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you can have your house buttled. Uh, yeah, not exactly what he's looking for, though. Although it kind of leads into the line of play now, where he just plays down everything and starts drawing cards, because, hey, your opponent has a bunch, and as you guys said, they're going to go one for one, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually kind of good. If, if there was no brawl in the opponent's hand, <laughs> and you're able to make this huge loader here onto the board, but unfortunately, Amnesiac has a brawl and a spare to have this board covered, but may not even feel pressured enough to react to this. Nope. Uh, <laughs> looks like Amnesiac is really confident that uh, there's no mirror entity in the deck, and, and that has to be the case. I mean, Amnesiac has done the research, and... He would never risk the risk the mirror entry, right? Yeah. That, 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 was my, that was my memory as well. I felt yeah. like this was duplicate right. and counter spell, so I think yeah. that is the case, yeah. Yeah, Amnijak would have probably looked a little bit more uh, concerned if he just slammed the <laughs> ground <laughs> within 10 seconds of his turn if he thought it could be. Right. Uh, so look, Talion did get those water elementals, uh, effectively sacrificing Arcane Blast and some other tools just to get more card drawn. The water elementals are very good traditionally in this matchup, but you have not seen a single brawl from your opponent, and you know he's running too. Yeah, you haven't seen Bash either. There's so many um, really great options that will be able to, to deal with them. Shield Slam still left in the deck as well. So, yeah, sure. These Water Elementals would have been nice to have earlier, really lock out some of the removal, ramp up some pressure. But it's getting to the point now where the, there's just too much resources in his opponent's hand, and he's gonna, just going to expect everything he plays to get removed one by one here. Right, would you see that? Bash get counterspelled. Shield Slam gonna come out, and Amnijak's still more than fine. And you know, it's this is a really, really good example of how just a few changes in a deck list can radically alter matchups. Yeah, this Warrior deck has been discussed a lot during the weekend, and it has really, it really showed its strength here once again. Such a dominating performance from Amnesia. Yeah, Amnijak gonna go ahead and go up two-one on this series with a very commanding performance and. Again, going back to Amnijak's confidence as a player, he never just played down the brawl to play down the brawl. He figured, this is exactly what I need to be doing with my resources to get the optimal outcome of just clearing the board, stabilizing, as you guys said. Manorum on the board could have been potentially looking at some damage. I'm just going to play down the Jessicar. I know you don't have enough damage and enough mana to do it. 
Yeah, and that's a really important skill to have with that deck in particular. It's yeah. If you're playing it as a newer player, your reaction is just to use the most appropriate removal card on every single threat that's played every single turn. And if you do that, you're going to run out of resources very quickly. You do need to evaluate when it's right to just leave minions on the board and use your health total as a resource. Right. Um, and then that way you have more resources stretched out across the game to eventually run them out of pressure. Yeah, such a powerful deck. Does it really have a win condition in, a, in the same way as the, as the older warrior list did have in form of playing big minions, playing that Yusera, drawing those cards, having that on the board? It just removes all the threats, it just kills all the stuff from the opponent and then in the end just wins the long game. Yeah, the win condition of that deck is making your opponent concede, which worked <laughs> out entirely to plan in that game. All right, well, we are going to send or toss over to Frodan, who has a very special interview waiting for us. That's right, Rob and crew. I'm standing with William, also known as Amnesiac, and his mother, Patrice, who has been watching alongside the action and being able to accompany Will to his game so far. I just want to get to know a little bit more while we have a quick break between games. Uh, what's, the, what's the balance like? Because William's also in high school. He's 15 years old. We always emphasize this. But he also does sports. He also tries to get top-notch grades. How is he balancing the lifestyle of being a Hearthstone player at this level and everything else back at home? Well, I think um, William's a very independent person, so he takes control of his life and he understands what his priorities are. So he's able to play the card game and when it's time to study for finals or prepare for a tennis tournament, he takes the time off. And um, that's basically how he does it. I do want to follow up and ask, how has Hearthstone impacted not only William, but also the family dynamic? I mean, a lot of people are paying attention to your son all of a sudden. He's very young. But at the same time, it's something that I feel like he's very proud of, an accomplishment on top of what he's doing in a normal life. Yes, we are very proud of William and his eSports competition. Um, I have to admit we're, it's hard for us because it's not really part of our culture. Um, but... We are happy that he's doing it, and I find that it's very stimulating for him, and he enjoys it. He's meeting wonderful people. Um, it's been a really great experience. Awesome. And then a real last, qu really quick last question. Do you have any advice for any parents who also have kids in similar positions who want to pursue something? Uh, how do they really balance that kind of uh, decision-making? Well, I think it depends on your child and, and the confidence that you have in them. And um, William, you know, we had a discussion about it, and we all agreed that as long as your other priorities stay intact, then we're more than happy to support you in your endeavor. So it's good to follow your child's passion. That's a great quote to end up. Thank you very much, Mom Nijiak, for that quick stop by. And we're going to head over to the crop in the desk to see their thoughts on that talk as well as get ready for game number four. All right. Thank you, Dan and Mom Nijiak. Uh, great to see such a supportive parent. I, too, had the opportunity to talk to uh, Mom Nijak, a little bit uh, in the first day where she was at the studio, and uh, of course, Amnijak had said some disparaging things about bow ties on social media. Felt the need to, you know, talk to her about this, kind of get him uh, on a level field where he understands just how cool bow ties are. So, uh, very productive conversations. Rob, you're not even wearing the bow tie today, and you still managed to bring it out. <laughs> uh, I just think it's a very important topic that should be dis or discussed more in the Hearthstone community. Yeah, but again, just, just going back to the interview, it is fantastic to see that level of support. You know, really saying you need to support your son's passions and also just seeing how successful Amnesiac is at balancing it and having a successful education career, actually pursuing other interests as well while being as successful as he is in Hearthstone. Yeah, it's quite amazing how he can possibly play on this level while while doing all the other things too everything with the school and sports and it's just like it's uh, it's really respectable right speaking of successful one game away from clinching this series advancing to the top four so just needs to pull out a win with druid which is something i feel like we said a lot over the course of the europe and america's preliminaries just need one win with druid right so doable right just draw the wild growths yeah, the, the problem is sometimes it doesn't. It's a deck that is exposed to some clunky draws, and on top of that, it's a deck that people target. It's a deck that you can really force out of the meta if you're trying hard enough, and Tempo Mage is one of the very best decks at doing that. It is, but there's no mirror entities in mm. Thalion's deck, and that's one of the key cards in uh, disarming the Druid. Yeah, I was going to say the faster version of Tempo Mage, which is 
one we tend to see more in ranked play. Has a very solid matchup against Druid. Uh, obviously, Innervate and Wild Growth, hijinks notwithstanding, because it just kind of outpaces the Druid. And, uh, you know, as much as Druid is, is kind of a maligned class at times by a lot of the player base, it does play fairly honestly. Like, it, aside from Innervate, it doesn't have that preparation for the big tempo moves. It doesn't have backstabs, which make Rogue so effective at it. So I am actually concerned for Talion because he is playing this slower, more value-oriented version of Tempo Mage. Yeah, there's still a lot of strong interactions in the deck, though. Flame Cannon is extremely powerful yep. against a lot of minions. You can still get ahead of them with a fast Mana Worm Sorcerer's Apprentice start. And you do have the ability to do that thing that Druids hate, which is swing the board in one turn. You know, Flame Waker plus spells, suddenly their board disappears. You have a minion of your own. Well, Amnesiac does have to, the ability to do that thing a lot of people hate, good. which is turn one piloted <laughs> Shredder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if he wants to. It's, it might be a thing to save those for later on, but I would expect... To, oh, yeah. he is he's going to save those. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd expect to see him break it up. Use the, the Innovate for one 4-drop and then they use the coin for a second 4-drop. That seems like the most natural curve to me. Yeah, makes a lot of sense too. Beaks of a shade of Naxxramas. I was going to say, do you think that complicates the equation at all? And just curious... Okay, interesting he's going to silence it because... With, a, as Savit's pointed out, no mirror entity in the deck, there may have been merit just to snipe it down, kill it, deal with the duplicate or counter spell as it comes out. But I guess his plan is to develop the Shredder next turn, although he did draw the Shade, so he doesn't necessarily need to be able to coin next turn and be scared of a counter spell. Yeah, that was definitely very interesting, because the, the coin would have dealt with the counter spell, so he's a great leader from the portal. Damn. <laughs> hey, that's plus one attack for your minions. It's. Yeah, the all minions, not just those. Not that just charge, charge minions. Yeah. I was gonna say it's, uh, it is uh, the cousin of Warsong Commander. Both orcs, both leading the charge. Uh, well, not so much anymore. For I miss you, Warsong Commander. Come back to me. <laughs> I don't. Uh, <laughs> we see there he chooses to not use the arcane blast to put some chip damage on the keeper of the grove because he does have that flame waker. Right. And it's important to have spells to make the most of that minion. Yep, absolutely. And uh, Amnesia here. Because that Keeper of the Grove is still up, he will have to make a decision which minion from Talion is he going to eliminate. Yeah, I mean, the Raid Leader obviously having the biggest effect on the board right now, but the, the Sorcerer's Apprentice is one of those minions that you give a ton of respect to when playing against this deck, because the, the tempo that can build up if you let it live is, is pretty spectacular. And Amnesiac, considering a Savage Roar here, just to be able to react to this board more effectively. Yeah, he doesn't want to leave the Sorcerer's Apprentice up. But also, uh, the, the Raid Leader is not is not a joke. <laughs> it does add up to quite a bit of damage if, if it uh, buffs minions for multiple turns. Yeah, it's, yeah. Actually, it's actually a ton of respect for a Raid Leader at the end of the day there, because that Raid Leader built, brought out the Savage Roar. If the Sorcerer's Apprentice was just on board, it would have just traded with the Keeper. He would have played a 4-drop. So. Now you're on Raid Leader's side. Okay, Saddle, I see how it is. Hey, I, I just I just go where the party is. Yeah, like, interesting choice from Amnesiac. They're using the, the Roar instead of the Wrath on the previous turn, but here we see it pay off, but because with the Roar, if, if he went with the Roar last turn, he would not have been able to deal with that Flame Waker. Right, and obviously, we've talked about this over the course of the weekend, breaking up that Druid combo of Savage Roar, Force of Nature, using those pieces to uh, win out the game early, or at least put yourself in a better position, and uh, I liked it there, because Wrath was a lot more flexible, you could use it to cycle for a card, use it on that Flame Waker, which we saw, so heads up play by Amnesiac there. Yeah, it's something that people have got much, much better at as time has gone on, is realizing that sometimes the best uses of that Force of Nature and Savage Roar is not together on turn 9 or beyond, but it's to put yourself in a more advantageous position in the early game. Yeah, I think it's really matchup specific on how you need to use those parts. In some in some matchups, it's, it's very important to keep it for later on, to have that burst against, like, let's say, Control Warrior. You, you really want to have that reach with the combo. But when you're playing against an aggressive strategy, you know that uh, if you make it to turn 9, you're probably doing pretty well anyway, so you don't really have to save it as much as you, you do some other times. Quick turn from Amnesiac goes right for Dr. Boom, and Talion's actually got him pretty low, so something like an Arcane Intellect into a Fireball would put him really close. Yeah, Arcane Intellect wouldn't quite get him there. Even the second Frostbolt would be one damage off, I believe. He'd have 10, uh, sorry, 12 after using all of his mana. Fireball is two damage off, 11 total. So there, were, there wasn't a lethal draw from the Arcane Intellect there, I don't believe, but still gives him the resources that he needs now to potentially just consider setting up a two-turn lethal here. Yeah, he can certainly do that here, but if he goes for the Fireball, uh, there would be a chance that Amnesiac would have an Ancient of Lore in his hand mm. to be able to heal out of out of the lethal range. So it looks like he is go going to opt to go for the, the minions first. 
after seeing that Dr. Boom, do you feel any better about the odds of the Ancient? Oh. Relic here off the unstable portal. Boys, this is officially an e portal as he gets that Alec here. Wind Fury, Charge, Divine Shield, and Taunt. Look at all those keywords, Rob. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I've been training. That's too long, didn't read, but it seems good. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty good when you're looking to do damage, and uh, he can use that to close out next turn, assuming no Taunt comes down. And we see Amnesiac doesn't have one. He doesn't have heal, so... Uh, very exciting to see Alec here make a cameo in this tournament. I hope he is. I mean, he still has a lethal just with the Fireball and the Frostbolt, but I mean, how do you not Alec here? No, oh, you Alec here and you Frostbolt. That's what you do. Yeah, you have to do it. Oh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's still lethal, yes. It would still, I was, like, I was yes. like, no, it's only nine damage, but because of the damage that the. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you Frostbolt or Alec here first? He's thinking about it. He's like, which do I do? Uh, I think you Alec here, then you, then you <laughs> greetings multiple times, then ah. you wait until the end of the rope. This is the play that everyone makes against me on ladder, so I assume this has to be correct. Well, you gotta understand the, the BM meta. Yeah. It's always changing and evolving. I, I mean, I, I think you should save the Alec here for last, but how do you have the patience to wait to play it? I would be just They're like... Just okay, okay. Dragging, <laughs> it, dragging it, dragging yeah. it, dragging it, but Can't that is gonna to mean a tie series. We talked about how in this matchup, you know, Talion was going to need something big off the unstable portal, and he had it anyway. I don't, I don't, for the people at home, I do want to point out there was enough damage between the Frostbolt and the Fireball, but got to win with style, and it's about making a name for yourself, so tie series. Yeah, and what that, what that Alakir actually did is it gave him a lot more security if um, Amnesiac had some defensive options, some taunts, maybe the Ancient of Law to heal, then he had the ability to stretch out over time, so... Yeah, we are going to now have a game five, and it's going to be Amnesiac on the Druid against Talion's um, like anti-aggro warrior, and I have to say, it favors Amnesia quite a bit, in I, my opinion. Yeah, it does, but I, I've spoken with some people who've played this deck quite extensively, played a lot of recent innovations in Control Warrior, and they really sell the mantra that Control Warrior is coming back into that matchup very Ooh. heavily. Wow. Yeah. Right, want to point out this poll, again, we're two and two, dead even, and this poll is basically the exact same way, so... Uh, this is it, game five. Get out there, support who you have moving on. Hashtag HCT, hashtag Amnesiac, hashtag Talion. Don't do both. Then you're voting for both, and that's strictly wrong. Because <laughs> you got to vote for one. Right. Nice analysis, Rob. <laughs> I knew we had you here for a reason. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, just being handsome, too. But yeah, we are going to get into this game five really quickly here, guys. And uh, I actually have to say, over the course of this weekend, I feel like we've seen the Control Warrior beat out the mid-range Druid, I believe, it one or two times. We saw it with Chalky and Nostum, and if you can just keep going one for one on the Druid, the Druid doesn't hit those important drops, the, the Ancient yeah. Allure. Exactly. Uh, I, was, I was just about to get to that, because Amnesiac has the information what kind of Warrior Talion is playing, so keeping something like Azure Drakes, even Ancient of Lores, although it's seven mana, in the starting hand is a viable strategy for sure. Yeah, it does take a little bit more finesse as the Druid than the usual matchup against Control Warrior. You really have to be able to, say, play two minions at a time by using an Innovate in the mid-game, so they can't just keep going one-for-one one spot removal with everything you play, because that is very much the Druid style, right? You play the one biggest thing that you can play on each turn, and you just curve through. If you keep doing that against this deck, they're stacked up with all these options to go one-for-one right. one with your stuff. So you really have to find those mid-range power spike turns where you can get ahead of what they can possibly do back to you in one turn. They're and use that as a platform to build on. Yeah. All right, well, before we get into this match, let's take a quick moment to learn a little bit more about Talion. Again, one of the players not as well known as Amnesiac. So uh, during the winter preliminaries, he actually, you know, we saw him lose to Chalky as Chalky was just rampaging through the America's preliminaries. He's still alive though, and Chalky's out. Yeah, he got his revenge yesterday on Chalky and by eliminating him from, from the tournament. Yeah. Yes. He also studies actuarial science, which is something that I had to Google because this kept coming what up. Is and it? I had to, it's it's financial risk assessment is what it is basically. Yeah. It's pretty good in Hearthstone, knowing right. risk assessment, brinksmanship. Yeah. These are <laughs> yeah. these are important things, especially when you're about to get into this match with this uh, anti-aggro control warrior, as we're now terming it. So. Uh, very, very important skills to have. Pretty good. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to this matchup because it's something that I'm just personally really interested in. I love these matchups where opinion is split. You know, the Warrior Specialists yeah. are starting to make the point that, no, this has classically been a bad matchup for us, but I think we're coming back into it. I think the Warrior can do things now with this new build. And of course, classical opinion just says Druid just beats up on Warrior. It's just too aggressive, too efficient. Yeah, I've, I've actually heard uh, a, lot of, a lot of players also uh, argue in favor of the Warrior, but the, the reason why I personally consider the Druid to be the favorite is just the, just the like wave of minions and the the, right. the 
longevity that the, that the Druid has in making proactive plays. Some of the key points and things that could go wrong with the Druid is maybe not finding their card draw, running out of those those minions while the, while the warrior can keep itself sustained. Right, this is it though, game five. Winner of this advances, loser goes home. Hearthstone World Championship ticket on the line. All the pressure in the world for these two players. And Amnijak going to be on that Druid. Talion on the Warrior. Looking at Warrior's opening hand here, you see the Fiery War Axe. That's an auto include. You just you just keep it, right? Or do you not against the Druid because Darnassus Aspirin has been phased out? Right. These players have information about the list. Classically, Fiery War Axe is a card that would go back against Druid. You have no need for it. There's no minions for it to interact with. Then Darnassus Aspirin was introduced to the game. Suddenly became a keep because you had to shut down that Aspirin. Nowadays, are they playing it? Are they not? Talion will have that information. I don't believe we've seen Aspirant from Amnesiac's deck. No, I don't think so um, So the War Axe really is a keep, only really interacts with the first half of Piloted Shredder, for example. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good card to have against the Piloted Shredder, but also in combination with something like Bash, you can mm. take out those Druid of the Claws. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Right, so... Do you see the wild growth from Amnesiac? This is very important to, to get ahead of those cur or ahead of the curve, as you were saying. Saddle, get those big mid-range minions out that the warrior has trouble dealing with. Yeah, more important in this matchup, much more important than a one-off innovate early. This isn't a matchup where you can just innovate one big minion out early and just hope that it carries you the whole way through. You really do want that consistent high mana usage throughout the game. So wild growth is the best card to have in your opening. At four mana, Amnesia going for the hero of power didn't really have anything else to play, but he had that wild grow to start things off and has a solid five, six, seven going forward. That said, are you necessarily looking to play the Thorisan with that hand unless you draw you know, some Ancient of Lore, some Force of Nature, Savage Roars, cards like that? Right, that's the other technique in this matchup. If you don't go for the, the, the real power spike turns and try and get ahead and beat them up, the other technique is if you get the big resource hand where you draw a bunch of Azir Drakes and Ancient of Laws and then fill up your hand with like three or four combo pieces, you just jam Emperor on that and then suddenly, you know, Fatigue Warrior is not going to be able to carry that to Fatigue because you can threaten 20 plus 30 damage over the course of the game. Mm -hmm. Right, so I was going to say, we saw Italian equip that Fiery War Axe, but Savits, is it all that useful anymore? <laughs> it's coming back to haunt him now. Not attacking with it earlier, because he really wants to play the Death Spite here. But if he does play the Death Spite, the Fiery War Axe got zero value, and it just feels so bad. Seems like he's going to take a little bit of a slower approach. But yeah, playing that Fiery War Axe early on definitely came back to hurt him. In this and again, instance. to reiterate the point, he chose to keep it against a deck that we believe does not play Darnus' Aspirin, and we can see he's not really going to get a lot of work done. Sure, he's going to be able to, to slam twice into this Lothar, but the Death Spite would have done the job a lot cleaner. I get sure he gets the opportunity to take 10 damage. Yeah, <laughs> woohoo! <laughs> yeah, in this in this game there, keeping the Fireworks really didn't pay off at all. But in case that he was unfortunate uh, to, to not draw any other weapons at all, I think it's still nice to have a, Weapon, even if it's a fighter war, actually, sure. not a death spite. Yep. Now, we do see the Brawl in the hand of Talion, and Brawl is one of the cards that does a fairly good job of dealing with Dr. Boom just because it, when it comes in, makes other minions, so it gives it a better chance of getting rid of the 7 7 body of Dr. Boom, but mm -hmm. never a clean thing, and there's always that chance that the good doctor lives on. Yeah, a wise man once told me the measure of a good card is if it one for one's Dr. Boom, so things like Brawl and, <laughs> Brawl and Light Bomb, for example, fit into that category. Yeah, it's a very elite club. Twisting Nether likes to hang out there sometimes, <laughs> yeah. too. But uh, the discount comes in from Nijak from that Emperor Thor's hand. Uh, again, not necessarily the, the best suite of cards to get those discounts on, but it's better than nothing. It will allow you to do some cool stuff later on with stuff like Azure Drake and Swipe as a combo, although much less relevant against this style of warrior. Uh, it can do some things. Shield Maiden, for example, is one of the core minions that can really help to Warrior to build a ball presence. So Azure Drake Swipe is a great answer to that. So it, it, can, sure. get some, it can get some work done in this matchup for sure. Yeah, just going to see go. one of those two brawls <laughs> come out. Let's see. This is huge. If the Dr. Boom wins. It's just not so... Uh, the Boom Bomb hits boom for four, though. So Ooh. does get a pretty good effect out of it. Yeah, and since Dr. Boom was the only minion in play, there wasn't anything else. It's not even a true one-for-one one because the, the last Boom Bot does hang around, so... All right, Namnijak just going to be able to restock that board. And uh, while I was saying that the Emperor Thorisand discounts were necessarily the most advantageous, he does have the ability to just jam things down on the board, and he's just going to continue to rebuild it and hope that at some point he just overpowers Talion. Yeah, everything seems to be going Amnesiac's way right now. He, after that brawl, he's easily able to get a new strong board, and he just got an Ancient of the Floor too, so 
even if this board gets cleared, he can he can just keep drawing and drawing and play more threats. Yeah, that said, Dr. Boom being gone is good for Talion because the mid-range Druid doesn't necessarily have that many big threats. You've seen the Thorasan, you've seen the Dr. Boom now, and now you're just in that territory where you have to weather the storm against stuff like Combo, which is very scary, mind you. Yeah. And the mid-range minions like Druid of the Claw, Ancient of Lore. <laughs> that feels bad, man. Big Game Hunter right there. There's exactly one target for the, for the Big Game. Right. But in the turn after he dealt with the Dr. Boom without the BGS, he draws it then. Oh. Usually not the way that goes. The big game hunter is almost always on time the second somebody plays a Dr. Boom in these matches. Uh -huh. <laughs> Someone do boom, but put a big game hunter on top of your opponent's deck. Yeah, I believe Disguise Toast made a video highlighting that. I believe so. He's wrapping his own boom bot here. Gets full oh. damage. I was going to say, I think, yeah, he got. He just had the free chance to potentially what? check for lethal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was, I was counting this at the start of the turn. I was like, if he wraps his own boom bot here, he can potentially have lethal. He took the free roll to do it. What a huge play from Amnesiac. Amnesiac realizes he has a chance to close out the series right then and there. Yep. Punches ticket to the top four. Does it. It works out. And now he is going to emerge victorious from this series over Talion. Talion is going home. Amnesiac lives another day. I wanted to elaborate on the point because it was essentially a free roll. He drew the card off the boom bot. He had the opportunity to just say, okay, if this doesn't work out, I can just continue developing with the Ancient of Law. Recognize the situation, got rewarded for it, and he is going to go through, as you see his, uh, his mother there looking extremely happy with the situation. <laughs> yeah, hard not to be proud when your son who's in school playing tennis and doing like eight other things also makes it to the top four of the America's Winter Championship. So. Pretty, Proud mom, but a pretty talented kid. We're going to throw it over to Dan, who's going to be talking to Amnesiac about his victory. Amnesiac, yesterday I saw someone uproot their Ancient of War, but today I saw someone rat their own booba for the lethal. I mean, that went according to plan, exactly what you were thinking, right? Yeah, I mean, that's for every time, because, I mean, I'm already ahead, so the game's just going to help me out more. That's how that works. Sure, it seems like day number three, you're firing on all cannons, able to play your strategy out, and it seems like everything's working. Is there anything um, to secret to how you're looking so good today? I got the matchups I really wanted. I, I'd say I got really lucky game three. It was kind of just a flip whether I got um, it, Warrior Mirror, which can be a little janky sometimes, you know, with Elise and everything and who gets Justicar first. But I got the Tempo Mage into the Warrior, and I had quite a good draw with War Axe, Death Lord, and I hit Justicar early. I also think I was really happy with how I played. Like, I had one turn where I could have shield blocked, and I played on, and played on curve and gotten an armor up, but I recognized that I had so much life gain, I just wanted to develop a weapon. That actually worked out really well that game. So I think it's a combination of me really being in the zone and getting some good matchups and favorable flips. What's the, what's like the key to your confidence? I think a lot of people, they come to the stage, they break down, especially when they're on the verge of elimination and it's day three where the, the tension's the highest. What keeps you so strong in your confidence in yourself? I mean, it's probably just sheer amount of practice. I've played a lot of games, especially there. Like in the Druid, I've, I've been in situations like that, and I'm looking at it like, well, I probably want to draw a card anyway off this Wrath, and I just have a 1 in 4 to win now, so I'm going to take it. And I'm not going to think, oh, I need this 1 in 4. I'm just going to be think. I'm going to be thinking more along the lines of how I've practiced rather than unique situations here. I'm, just, I'm thinking about how things have panned out in the past and how it will pan out with how I do what I do. All right, well, congratulations, Amnesiac. We might be interviewing you all day, depending on how things go. But for now, we're going to send it over to the sidebar with TJ and Raynad, who will break down that match. Thank you very much, Dan. And once again, a big congratulations to Amnesiac for moving on to the next decider match. Let's take a look real quick at the final Group A bracket. The two players moving on are going to be Nostum in that first seed and Amnesiac taking the second spot from Group A to move on to the semifinals. Uh, so let's get right into breaking down that match. I want to start off in the uh, uh, Mage versus uh, Warrior matchup early on. I believe it was game number three. Uh, so we can bring that up. This is one of those, you know, classic Tempo Mage situations where uh, Talion's faced with a tough decision, an early Death Lord, and uh, he's got to use a lot of resources to clear this off. So, Raina, talk to me a little bit about uh, why a Temple Mage uh, is okay with using so many resources to take out an early Death Lord. Yeah, it's a bit unintuitive to spend so many cards dealing with one minion, but with Temple Mage, you're kind of okay using a lot of resources in order to get ahead on board. And in this case, he is using three cards to kill one minion, but he's getting one of those cards back off of the Death Lord. And he does pull a pretty big minion in Lotheb. So overall, pretty solid play, very aggressive. And these are the kinds of lines of play you just have to take sometimes when you're playing a deck like Tempo.
Yeah, and that's, you know, sort of what the term tempo means is, you know, getting the giving up card advantage at times. Yeah, for some, some people associate uh, like, sorry, <laughs> a card advantage as trading like cards for more cards mm -hmm. uh, and getting tempo is basically trading cards for mana. Yeah. And so you saw, saw him get the board control there by giving up that card advantage. So uh, that's a really good example of how that deck's supposed to function. He did, and Amnesiac did end up taking that game with the Warrior because it is a tough matchup. Uh, but overall, uh, sometimes those are necessary plays when you're playing Temple Mage. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the second clip. Uh, now this clip, there's not too much to analyze because it's sort of a fun clip. Uh, but Raynan, I want you to talk to me a little bit about this matchup in general. Uh, what a Temple Mage has to do to win and its strengths and uh, what a druid can do to sometimes stop this. So uh, we, we can go ahead and roll it and see exactly the fun thing that happened in this play. Yeah, like, like most of the matchups uh, with Tempo Mage, your main goal is to just get dudes on the table and then use all of your spells to kill your opponent's minions while hitting them every single turn. So uh, druid is very weak once it falls behind on board to any class because of a lack of good removal. So Talion established some minions, got to attack with them in the face a lot and finished the game off with some burn and a pretty cool Alakir play. Yeah, we can take a look at that uh, last Alakir play as well uh, to finish off the game. Like I said, not too much to analyze there, but uh, it is a tough matchup. He probably would have had lethal over the over a couple turns anyway, and he did it with style because he had the Fireball Frostbolt, but uh, just a little uh, fun thing to show there. Um, what, what's the Druid sort of counter to that type of strategy? How, as a Druid, going into a tough matchup like Tempo Mage, do you come out on top? Well, you just have to recognize that Mage is going to be a little bit faster at everything it does, and when you use your spells as removal, you're generally going to spend more mana killing their minions than the Mage spent playing them. So, Amnesiac in this game, for example, I didn't really like how he played it. I feel like the early turns where he spent playing spells, if he just developed minions instead and forced the Mage to spend mana killing minions rather than developing three threats, he would have been a lot better off. Yeah, and that's something that you just sort of have to balance. He would have had those spells later on to remove, yeah. so he might have been in a better position. Uh, but overall, Amnesiac, great play. He did end up winning the series. I want to get your thoughts on the last matchup just real quick, uh, the Druid versus Warrior matchup. And I've been talking to a lot of people about that matchup, and they say that the New Age Warrior is a lot better off. Just give me your thoughts on uh, where the Druid versus Control Warrior matchup stands in, the, in the, its current form. Uh, in my opinion, it still favors Druid, but it's so close to 50-50. I mean, it really just depends on player experience, mulligans, draws. Uh, I think like Amnesiac played the game pretty well this time around. Um, there are some things Italian definitely could have got done better. But yeah, you just constantly develop threats a little bit ahead of curve, constantly have a stream of card draw with Azure Drake, Ancient of Lore, and eventually you're just threatening combo every turn. So yeah, so it seemed like a pretty easy victory for Amnesiac in that match. Yeah, so he's going to move on to the semifinals. We will be seeing him later on. But before we get on to those semifinals, we are going to go to the decider match for Group B. But before we head there, let's take a look at some highlights from that last match.